Our next session is a group of um, innovation speakers, and uh, we're very much looking forward to this session. They're short and snappy presentations, so we will be um, we won't have time for questions after each one. <clears throat> we'll get the speakers to move to the stage, if you would please, after your, your presentation, and we will have a panel discussion afterwards. So um, because they're so short, I'll ask the speakers to make sure they're readily um, able to get to the stage quickly so that you don't lose any of your own speaking time. Our first presenter this morning, and I'm sorry, Tom, I didn't get to meet you before the... I hope you're here. Excellent, thank you. Um, Tom's a principal scientist in Healthy Waters at Auckland Council, and he has a decades applied experience of water quality science, land and water management across New Zealand's primary and local government sectors. I won't take any more of Tom's time, and uh, welcome to the stage, Tom. Is it quicker? Cool. Great. Um, kia ora. Uh, Kei Tom Stevens Aho. Um, I've been introduced, that's great. I don't like to dwell on myself as much as look at the team. There's a hell of a lot of people working behind the scenes in Auckland Council on a particular topic that Ian Maxwell raised yesterday that I really want to dwell on, which is operationalising plans. Um, we've been asked today at this conference to make sense of the complex uh, and certainly what I'm going to do today is very complex and I don't think I'll make much sense of it, so forgive me. But um, if by the end of it I have, then I hope you realise um, a couple of things. One, that planning as a whole, and I say this on behalf of having worked in industry and now in government, um, I, don't, I don't see, and I think Ian dwelled on it, I don't see the direct coupling between planning and operations very often. And I come from a very large unitary council and I come from a department alone of 300 staff who do nothing but water. We spend $100 million a year on all sorts of water-related projects. And I can safely say the coupling between planning at a regional level and delivering, actually managing an outcome, isn't quite right in local government yet. And I think it's because of the emphasis we place on policy in the absence of delivery. And it's that tight loop. So today what I really want to dwell on is this notion of accounting. I think accounting is the critical tool that allows us to go back. It's a terrible term. The abstract, I likened it to dentistry. It's kind of, um, it can be incredibly boring to talk about. I'm hopefully going to make it a bit more lighthearted. But if you get it wrong, a bit like dentistry, it can be incredibly painful. And a bit like dentistry, what you're doing in it is meant to be targeted work. You know, if someone comes in with a degree of pain in their tooth, you don't go in and rip out the whole jaw. That's not the solution. You go in and you might do a filling. You might recommend some ongoing care, some change in how you behave, your diet. Um, land management, catchment management is the same. We don't go in and we don't go, right, let's just change land use immediately. That's generally not the solution. It's the most painful thing you arrive at. But to get there, you have to go through all your options. You have to examine kind of what are the critical things that might not be right about your water quality. Why are they not right? What are your options to treat them? And effectively, everyone here does that a lot better than I. I'm just an applied scientist. You know, I'm a charlatan. I'm not actually a land manager. Um, most of my team over there are. But I come from a world where science really should be applied. And that's what we've been trying to do. And the term accounting covers that. So what I want to show you up on screen there is a simple visual of how you might operationalize an objective in your regional plan. That, for me, is a part of the Manico. That's the catchment. That is the set of actions out of several hundred thousand I could pursue in several, I think it's about 70-odd small catchments of about 100 hectares. So several hundred thousand possible things I could do stretching across a gradient of good farming practices, wetlands, detainment bunds, space planted, poplars, hill country control, urban devices. I've examined hundreds of thousands of possible choices and gone, how do I get my phosphorus in stream down to an A grade? How do I manage those concentrations down? And it is complex. This isn't a generalized thing, and the rest of the talk is going to dive into the complexity. But effectively, my job is there to give land management and catchment management direction, is to say, if someone comes out with an objective and says, achieve this grade, I actually have a series of feasible actions you could pursue. I've looked across the actions, I've costed them, I've looked at the effect that they would induce in particular parts of the catchment, and how, as David Parker raised yesterday, the cumulative effect flows through the catchment to arrive at what Ian was mentioning. What are my actions? How much are they going to cost? Who's going to do them? Where do I do them? What scale? And that, and I'm sorry I'm glossing over it, 10 minutes is not long to cover five years' worth of work, 
But that is effectively, as you can see, every one of the black lines is a small catchment. There are blue lines for the rivers. You can barely see it, but the rivers are shaded green depending on the amount of riparian management I'd recommend doing to prevent phosphorus from getting in stream. And you can see the major solutions in this catchment really aren't riparian management. The shading of the catchments is showing you the degree of adoption of good farming practice. And we've got horticulture, we've got various forms of pasture, we've got some urban activities in this part of Manico. They've all got a range of different practices they could pursue. The dots are very simple representations of quite a lot of detail, I'll show you. Um, and they're just effectively wetlands, wetlands and detainment bands of different size, different location. And we've scaled them, we've identified of the several hundred you could actually retire in this catchment, which are going to deliver the most treatment for the least cost. So this, this is the innovation. And Duncan's going to be talking later with Steph about how these sort of tools and systems are used to best spend $200 million on arresting sediment in the Kuiper. Sarah's going to talk about programs like the Hotio, which deliver a lot of science that we ingest. And that there is the rest of my consortium. There's an enormous number of researchers, international and national, involved in this work. Right. Um, that's accounting. Accounting is just an exercise of examining your water quality, your sources, where they go, and what you can do to intercept them. Now I have to admit the dodgy lie, which is accounting is modeling. And having said that, I suspect many of you are going to go, oh, piss off. Modeling is awful. Modeling is always wrong. Um, and I'm the first to accept that some models have been used really inappropriately. They're just a tool. You know, don't use a screwdriver as a hammer. You'll cause damage. But that doesn't mean throw the screwdriver out of your toolbox. Um, and in this case, our models tend to be quite distinct and unique. They're quite complex. They're process-based. They're not statistical. So what we end up doing is looking at landscape characteristics. And some of you will have come across physiographics and other estimates of kind of soil properties, geology, slope, land activity. We account for all of that and say, if it rains in a 15-minute interval, how much will run off? How much is going to contribute as interflow or groundwater? What amount of phosphorus, nitrogen, E. coli, sediment, copper, and zinc is going to travel with it? And it's that detailed knowledge that we build up so we do what's called process-based modeling. Statistical modeling tends to be the norm, and that's what most people do. It's a black box. You're looking at a correlation. You're not looking at causation. Just because you can identify what the typical concentration is for half the year doesn't mean you know which days it's occurring, where it's occurring, or why. We do. We purposely have built models to do that. So here's a representation of a bit of Kuiper, just showing you up the top that we predict flow. And that's because this model is continuous. Every 15 minutes for a 15-year period, over 5,500 catchments, and they're all linked, we do these assessments to go, did it rain, didn't it rain? Was it a dry spell before? Was it wet before? That's going to govern and change the amount of runoff and the amount of contaminant going in your stream. We link it all together. That gives you your flow predictions. This is ammonia down the bottom. It's just a toxic form of nitrogen. And what I'm showing is typical sampling once a month that SOE programs undertake. And in our region, this is pretty, pretty normal. Um, and then the predictions every 15 minutes scaled back to a day, showing you that for a short-lived contaminant like ammonia, and it is short-lived, readily oxidizes, you actually get these pulses. And your ability to detect those pulses when you sample literally once a month is very low. But when we're asked by regulation to operationalize, we have to manage for a thing called the 95th percentile. It happens once a month, no more than once a month. Any concentration and exceedance of that is what you need to manage. And that's what I'm showing here. These are the national bottom lines. That line there, you can't exceed for more than half a year. We definitely do. That line there, you can't exceed more than once a month. We definitely do. So anything orange, and that's just one location, but keep in mind we have 5,500 and we link them. Any stream there that's orange or red is failing the national bottom line for ammonia. And I have detailed understandings of why it's failing. Because it's a process-based model and it's not statistical, I can go back to the individual catchments, thank you, and say it's these land uses, these activities. They're the ones contributing to that failure. Now that is detailed knowledge, it's diagnostic. It reveals a critical condition. This is what you're managing. We're not managing year-round conditions. We're managing periods when the water quality is degraded. That's our focus. And I say that on behalf of ratepayers because I will never get money from my ratepayers to go off and do what I like outside of the window I need to manage for. And that is they will be upset that they can't swim or that there's an effect for a short period of time. That's what I need to deliver an outcome on, not year-round. I would love to do year-round, but it's that narrow window. Right, I'm going to hustle through. Um, this is data sets that Duncan will cover. Effectively, to get to the point that we are now, those action plans, you need to know how water behaves, where it flows. And for us, it's complex. We have stormwater as well. You have to do this for every intervention that you have in your library. And we have about 60-odd rural and urban. And we vary them depending on the type of pastoral and horticultural and forestry system you are. So different costs, different effects. You have to identify where you could do them. Then you have to cost them. And we look at 50-year costs. We're not really particularly interested in short-term programs. We're talking about long-term, sustainably, least-cost action plans. 
So what is going to cost the community the very least over the lifespan of this kind of program? And what that looks like is this. This is detailed information showing you where you can put wetlands or retire wetlands based on soil type, slope, and um, runoff. The green corridors are just your stream corridors. The buffered area is the area of land that would be sheet flow. So anything upstream of there is not going to get treated by that corridor because it's going to push right through because it will be preferential. Um, whereas all these pink areas drain to potentially a wetland opportunity. And they could be treated by the wetland. And the question I ask is, how do all these opportunities over a large part of the Manico all integrate? Where do I spend my money best to get this water quality outcome? Headwaters, downstream, a mix of both. Don't know. And so we can do that exercise in each of our catchments. And what we do is take, awesome, what we do is take every one of those opportunities you can see. And we do detainment bunds, wetlands, hill country space planting, uh, ponds, constructed wetlands, then a range of urban devices. We wield them all together and we create hundreds of thousands of possible things you could do in each of those thousands of catchments over that 15 year period to go, what would they do? What would they cost? And for every possible combination, you're always going to end up with a mix of things that for every small amount more money always does the most work, does the most good. That's our optimum. We wield it together, gives us a complex curve, and it just means that not all catchments are equal. Some, I should go back, to be fair, to cost my community the very least to get the water quality they want within the feasible boundaries of what they can do without land use change at this point, and with a detailed understanding of how the landscape's going to behave and respond, I invariably do more work in some catchments because there's more contaminant being generated and or there's more opportunity to do something that's cheap. And I'm interested in cost. And that's a representation. So, Peter, I'll just finish there if that's all right. And this is just to show you subtle differences. That's the A grade. That's the very best water quality for phosphorus I can achieve in the catchment. That's the C grade. They are subtly different. And the point is, for any one of the contaminants in our region now, different forms of nitrogen, phosphorus, sediment, E. coli, we can undertake hundreds of these action plans. Every one of those complex curves, those scientific abatement curves, have hundreds of points in them that are geospatial maps like this with detailed information in each catchment saying here's the amount of wetland area to retire, here's the amount of good farming practice to adopt of low, high, medium difficulty. And it's just a recipe. So I do have to finish on that one term that models are wrong. And this will be wrong, but this is the most directional way we can arrive if planners tell us to hit a certain water quality at what our land management team should do, how expensive it's going to be, how we're going to generate the money and revenue for it, because this this targeted approach is a lot cheaper than doing it in a blunt way. And if it's a lot cheaper, and Kuiper is a good example, we can save two and a half billion dollars by spending 200 million, then you can start to appeal to funders and others to get your money, because you've done the detailed costing work to say this is how I'm going to operationalize your plan. Cool. Sorry, Peter. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks very much. It just, uh... A fascinating presentation.